I remember I liked because the pressure wasn't there. It was almost like it was the pressure wasn't there. It was like uh, it was like the pressure was off. It was casual like Jim was supposed to be but wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and it was uh, I, I enjoy. I remember my music teacher was uh, 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 Ronald Cox, and it was he can call me Mister C, and that was the neatest thing in the world. That you know, he kind of gave us half of a break with his name, and right. everybody loved him and everything. And and uh, but the music and the art program, and I went to public schools. They were the first to get cut all the mm -hmm. time. They'd be you know there were years that, that missed them. Because they weren't there, then they were back, you know, mm -hmm. and and that room would get locked up, and then yeah. it would be unlocked another year, and um, it's it's you, you've been doing it for a long time, and you when you started, who mentored you? Uh, I I don't know that I I think that my real mentors were all of the great conductors that I had had as a professional and as a young musician coming up, my high school director, my junior high school director, the various music directors I worked under. In 1986, I was on tour with the Four Tops and the Temptations, and that music director was like another teacher for me because I was 20 years old. And, you know, I've, I've often said, if it, you know, if you looked up uh, Smack the Ass in the Dictionary, there'd be a picture of me at 20. You know? <laughs> it was just, it was just, I, you know... But there I was, you know, traveling around on a bus and truck tour all around the East Coast and the Midwest with this fantastic group, you know, 15, 18 years after their prime, but still packing stadiums and packing. Yeah. It was a great, um, a great experience. But that music director was a teacher. Um, the, uh, you know, the various conductors I worked under, I played in the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra um, as a ringer. Uh, for a couple of years and uh, went on tour of East and West Germany the the summer before the wall came down. Um, and, you know, he, while he was a very, very stern taskmaster, um, that conductor of the youth orchestra and also of my college orchestra at the time was a very, very big influence on what not to do. Um, Cause that's information as well. Right. Yeah. So, you know, all of those people were sort of my mentors, but I didn't really have one at school because no one teaches the same classes I do. I'm right. the only person that teaches those classes. Right. I, I had a teacher who teaches just chess for the school district wow. and he had no mentor because no one else does that. Yeah. So exactly. he's kind of inventing it. Um, yeah, you said... Was it the Temptations and the Four Tops at the same time? Were yeah. They, that's when they were... Yeah, it was the TNT 86 tour. And um, they had a... Was it know, like the Battle a, the Bands thing? Well, well going they, to they, they... Whenever we played in like a town baseball stadium or whatever, they would put a, a semi-trailer, a flatbed in the middle, and the band would be in the middle, and the Temps would be on one side, the Tops would be on the other, and... You would use one, you know, two giant books of charts of theirs, and they would do three or four songs, and the lights would go down, and then they'd come up and do three or four songs with the temps, and then lights would go down, and the tops would do four, and then they'd do a couple together. And then the big finale was like a, uh, usually a medley of a bunch of great Motown songs, some mostly theirs, but some others. And then people would go crazy, and we'd get on the bus and go to the next town. What's the difference between the temps and the tops? Uh... <laughs> That's a really good. That's a really good question. I I do think that generally speaking, the music that was given to the four tops to sing had a little more gravitas to it. Not that the Temptations didn't, but certainly in the golden age, you know, I think a, you think a tune like Bernadette, and then you think a tune like, uh, you know, My Girl. You know, to compare the two of them, they're very different songs. Right. Different songwriting teams, but both out of Motown. And around the same time, they were two sides of the same coin. Who danced better? Oh, that's a really... <laughs> honestly, the spinners. When I played with the spinners, those guys... Oh, my God, Mark. They did this routine to Rubber Band Man. You remember that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would take these giant... They weren't really rubber bands. They were like ropes that were the size of the singers. And they would uh, flash a strobe light 
during Rubber Band Man. We were playing Rubber Band Man, and they would do this dance with the, and it looked like they had rubber bands. And oh my god, those guys could dance. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, good dancers. Yeah, that. Wow. That, <laughs> so see, I, I did a lot of that stuff before I was in the service. So. So this is this is pre teaching. This is pre everything. Yeah. You came with all this experience, and yeah. that's and that, that's like I said when I when I. Uh, when I was talking to you earlier, I didn't mean it in a bad way that uh, when I met you and your wife, I felt like there was more to you than meets the eye. And many people, there's less to them than meets yeah. the eye. You well, know? she, you know, she owns a very successful event DJ company now, but for many, many years was one of the premier rock radio DJs on the East Coast at WHCN in uh, Hartford. And she has a book of photographs of her with every single huge rock star of the 1980s. Everyone from Motley Crue to Phil Collins to Elton John. And, you know, it's Elton John and Kim, you know, Phil Collins and Kim, you know, it's just, and she calls it her brag book. It's, yeah. ama it's amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, people go their lives to get one blurry picture, you know? Yeah, and there uh, she is, a whole book full of them. And then she was at WXPN um, here in Philadelphia for about nine years in the 90s. And that's when we first met. I recognized her from her radio days. And I said, you're that, Kim? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, I heard this to you back in the day. And, you know. What do you think, uh, what abilities make you good at your job? Well, um, the uh, one ability is it's not so much an ability as an affinity for many different things happening and many balls in the air. Or as I like to sometimes describe it in the busy time of the year, it's like those old TV shows, shows used to see where the guys would spin the plates on the yeah. handles, you know, and keep them going. That's really what it's like certain times of the year. And I wouldn't go so far as to say I thrive on that, but it certainly keeps me occupied. And not everyone can handle that many balls in the air at the same time and not drop them year after year after year. So that skill makes me pretty good at the job I have now. I was told several years ago that if for some reason I left, which I almost did, and my wife at the time got a job in Connecticut and we were going to move up there. Um, they were going to have to hire one and a half people to replace me because they couldn't find anyone that could do everything that I was doing, which was pretty flattering. I don't know if it's true, but you know. there's no better feeling than being replaced by two or three people. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no better feeling, yeah. you know, than, yeah. uh, that. And it, it's, it's interesting because the, uh, I had a guy on here who works with nine one one dispatch mm -hmm. and, different professions get different people that work and don't work and he talked about multitasking like you did yeah. and he said that the people that work best in this job are from the restaurant industry oh, they can handle yeah. this I said that makes sense that really makes sense because they're used to different things getting thrown at them and mm -hmm. I think that you know I don't know but I would imagine that um, you'd have to be able to juggle and adapt if you're touring and going places uh, and it's true some of some of the you know back then especially some of those things were very proscribed you know you had a schedule that you would get at the beginning of the week and have a lobby call for the you know what time you to be in the lobby meet the bus get on the bus take a nap put your walkman on um i got my first walkman before that tour so i have something to listen to my cassettes you know if you remember those yeah um uh definitely <laughs> most definitely multitasking what what did you play mostly? Uh, that was a trombone gig. Okay. That was all trombone in the horn section. Okay. Um, about 2004, I started taking uh, the bass guitar and upright bass a little more seriously. And since about 2004, I do about half of my work on trombone and about half on upright and electric bass. About half my gigs, one half on the other. So you've got all the musical talent that I don't have plus a normal person's down because I have, I have, yeah, well, I have none. Well, everyone has something, man. You have a voice. You can sing. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's my father said, you can't, you, you can't carry a tune in the basket. Oh, oh, <laughs> I, you, you just, I, I've, it's been, it's been one of those things that, you know, every now and then I'll try, I'll get a, 
I'll see an app that'll teach you to piano or something. Yeah, I'll yeah. try, but I I never get really further than I was in grade school, and I'm yeah. always stuck at the same level. But and then I see, I've always been impressed watching people uh, that can play the um, um, ma- mainly piano and guitar mm-hmm. uh, because they're very visual instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, and watching how people play, I've always, that's a skill I just don't have. And I've, I've seen different people play stuff. And it's like, you're talking the four tops of temptation. It's, it's interesting to see people that are both giants and both good in their own ways going at it, you know? Yeah, it was neat. Um, I, uh, commensurately, uh, so man, it's probably more than 10 years ago now. Out of the blue, I, I don't remember how I heard about this, but the Philadelphia Orchestra and the New York Philharmonic were both going to play at the when they opened that big outdoor center over in Camden. Okay. And they were going to put them side by side. And they were going to play a tune, play a tune, play a tune. Side by side comparison. Um, they sounded different when you heard them, but that's exactly... There's two of the greatest orchestras in the world, two of the top three in the United States for sure side by side not playing the same pieces but the same in the same spot at the same time it was crazy and people talk about the sound of the strings of the philadelphia orchestra and how it's unlike any other string section ever and it's really true and i can tell you that hearing those two you know giants next to each other it absolutely was different not better not one better than the other but completely different. Yeah, both good in their own right. Yeah, dude. exactly. How many people do you think you've taught over your career? Well, I generally have about 120 students on my you know roster, about roughly 120 a year times 21 years, whatever that math is, a couple thousand. Yeah, yeah. 2,600, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of people's lives to touch. That's the thing I think about. And I just, you know, like any teacher, I hope that at least one thing I said helps them somehow, you know. And and do, do you, have you had students come back? Have you seen students? Oh, absolutely. I've had the great, great pleasure of playing music with some former students because some of them have become really good musicians. There's a young jazz guitar player in Philadelphia that I've hired to play in my New Orleans brass band a couple of times because that's how good he is. But I absolutely remember when he was in eighth grade and his voice hadn't changed. And he, I asked him, you know, what do you play? He said, I play guitar and didgeridoo and violin. And I went, didgeridoo? You can't even hold that thing. You're four foot nothing, you know? (laughs) And now he's a very respected jazz guitar player. Yeah. Yeah. Last question before we go and do a little after show. What do you think your legacy will be? Um, I think after me that the complexion of the instrumental music program is going to change. And unlike a lot of other groups in school, the degree to which the program reflects the personality and and outlook of the conductor it's it's just you know i'm in touch with a lot of my colleagues from neighboring schools and they're very good friends and their instrumental music programs reflect their personalities and so the complexion will change but With all of the technology possible now, with things like smart music and the way that the kids can, you know, record um, excerpts on their phones and, you know, text them to their directors for grades and the the kinds of things that are going on with technology and whatever that I'm not really messing with that. I'm just the kids come in, give them repertoire. We rehearse. I help them. We have a concert. Um, I think it will change, but I think. I'm the seventh d- director ever s- since 1926, and you know I think part of my legacy is going to be is that I kept kept things going for 20 something years, you know. And That's and in going. a, you've probably you'll probably be the last director in a very changing time, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, because like you said. Um, well, thank you for coming, and we'll do a little bit after show, but it's been a pleasure talking to you. Sorry your wife couldn't be here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, 
and uh, 